You can Google whatever you want to know about our keynote speaker. So I'm just going to take a little personal advance here, if I may. When I first heard of Mayor Johnston, it was one of our longtime commissioners who worked with us, and she said, I've never met a more dedicated, a more sophisticated, and a more meaningful person who can run for office. As a former educator, she said to me, she said that he is going to bring to the State House exactly what we need when it comes to education. What a lot of you may not know is he's actually very adverse in black history. He's a person who believes in passion and the very words that Dr. King spoke of about equality. He came to our church when he was running for mayor, and I walked over to him. I said, hey, Mr. Mayor, and he said, not yet. We're working on it. I said, no, sir, you're going to be the next mayor of Denver. He was with a young man named Chase and Max Haynes, and he said, uh, you sound certain. I said, I'm so certain that we have you scheduled for the business awards <laughs> and for the maraid. And he laughed, and this young man, uh, Brother Deacon Barry Monzel, took a picture with them out in the uh, foray, and he said, all right, Mr. Mayor, it's done. I want to say this, that it's nice to have someone who believes in Dr. King's dream that took place in 1963 when he started the Poor People's Campaign. When Mayor Johnston was elected, and he said that he was going to get a thousand on-house people off the street by the end of the year. A lot of folks thought it was a pipe dream. He's a visionary. He is someone who knows how to make things happen and bring them to fruition. Without any further ado, I'll introduce the some, present the others, Denver's 46th mayor, Mr. Michael, the Honorable Michael Johnston. Well, hello, great to see you all. Thank you so much for being here on, on this incredibly important day. Um, uh, before I start, I do just want to take a moment to honor the profile of courage that is Wilma Webb. Um, I don't know, yes, you can give her many rounds of applause. For those of you who don't know the story, uh, Wilma Webb brought the bill to make the Dr. King holiday a holiday not one time, not two times, not three times, but four times until she finally succeeded, even at the cost of then having her own leadership seat taken away from her for this courage. And amazingly, she found a way to get this done with bipartisan support. Like in a time where people think nothing small is possible, she actually made the biggest of things possible by bringing people together. Just want to tell you how lucky we are in this state to have you, Representative Webb. I do just want to share what a profound honor it is for me to be able to give this keynote. Um, uh, probably long before I ever thought I'd end up as the mayor, I would have dreamed of being able to do this. Uh, uh, my mom will tell stories when I was five and six and seven years old. I used to get up on the fireplace and try to memorize the I Have a Dream speech and then recite it for all of my family on Christmas. Uh, spent every January watching the Eyes on the Prize series over and over and over. In fact, it was Dr. King that was the reason I took my first job uh, as a school teacher in Mississippi, because the last thing he worked on was the Poor People's March, which was trying to take folks out of Mississippi back to the nation's capital to focus on poverty. I wanted to see how much had changed in Mississippi since that poor person's march had marched out. Uh, and you know, when I was 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 and I hit very hard decisions, uh, it was always my dad that I went to for advice. Uh, and when you were navigating those difficult moments, you go to him, and that word matters. I lost my dad eight years ago, and now I feel like in those moments where the problems are the hardest, where you're trying to figure out how to be a better husband or a better father or a better community member, uh, I miss him the most you know, and wish I could find him now to ask him those questions again. I feel the same way about Dr. King, which is when you see the crises we face in our city today, 
or in our politics today or in our country today, I wish we just had him back for one more sermon. What would he say if he were here today to speak about what our city faces right now? What would he say about how we handle the crisis of homelessness or how we handle unprecedented numbers of migrants who are coming to the city or how we handle a political division unlike maybe we've seen since his time? Well, the great news is when I go looking for what he would have written in the next chapter, I always go to what he wrote in the last chapter. Um, and I brought this book because I've owned this book since I was 13 years old. Uh, it's a testament of hope. It's every single word that Dr. King ever wrote. Um, and uh, like all books that you love, the spine is always broken in one location. Um, and for me, that spine is broken on what I think is maybe the most profound and prophetic speech in American history, which is the last speech that Dr. King ever gives. It's the speech of April 3rd, 1968, at the Mason Temple in Memphis, the night before he's assassinated in Memphis. And uh, he gets called out there in the middle of a storm. And he gives the speech that many people remember as the mountaintop speech or the if I had sneezed speech or the speech about labor activation or corporate boycotting. I mean, it is to many people many things. But to me, there are three little gems in that speech that are the ones I go back to, which is why this is where my crease is broken in this book that I do think give me guidance in these moments. Because I think when we feel the most lost, I go to that person who I think of as having the best moral compass of maybe any American in the 20th century. When it feels hard to find our way out of the darkness, I go looking for light in these pages from someone who I think was maybe our greatest lighthouse for justice. And in that speech that night, uh, he opens uh, with uh, a interesting story we talks about if he had to talk to God and God had asked him at any moment in history that he wanted to live. And he tells the story about flying through all of the other moments in history and asking God, please, just to allow him to live a couple of days in today. And he says for that, he says, now that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick, trouble is in the land, confusion is all around, that's a strange statement but I know somehow that it's only when it's dark that you can see the stars. When I think about some of the challenges we face in this moment, I think about the crisis I was attending to yesterday, which is, yes, today we have now almost 5,000 migrants living in shelter in our city tonight. They have walked 3,000 or 4,000 miles uh, to get here. They are fleeing a country that has 34,000% inflation, has people being murdered for dissent, and they're trying to find their way to a country that had said, send me your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And I was at this camp where we were helping move people, and I was walking around, and at each site, uh, people would ask me the same questions. You know, why, why can I please just get a job? I don't need any help, all I want is the ability to work. Can I please get a job? And I was at this encampment and I, I walked through probably for an hour and talked to people and must have ans answered that same question 30 times. And after that, I held an entire press conference answering that question again for another 10 minutes. And after it's over, I was, I was going to leave and as I'm walking to get in the car, a man who I'd seen, he'd followed me the whole time, been on my shoulder for the full hour, listened to everything I'd said. He tapped me on the shoulder and, and he says, uh, Mr. Mayor, look at me. I walked 3,000 miles to get here. So I have big hands. I have a strong back. I have a big heart. All I want to do is to work. I want to help your city. Can I do that? And I, and I wanted to say, well, didn't you just hear that question I answered 27 times about this very topic for the last hour when you've been standing right next to me? And I realized that that wasn't his question. He wasn't asking me, is this the law? He was asking me, is this justice? Is this what you think is fair? Is this what you think you committed to when you said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal? He was asking what King had asked, which is, is America going to default on the promissory note we wrote when we penned the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? That was his deeper question. And I didn't have an answer to that question. And so I realized in those moments, we do what King did. We do what Wilma Webb did. We fight and we advocate and we push to change the laws that are unjust 
and we refuse to follow laws that we think are still unjust. And so we will, thank you. <laughs> uh, and so we, I will go to DC next week uh, and push and lobby for change on work authorization, for change on federal funding, for change on coordinated entry plans, so that we can show people both the dignity and the humanity they deserve in a way that supports them to succeed and supports our city to succeed. And that is what I believe that in those moments where it feels the darkest are actually the moments it's clear enough to see the stars. There are stars here. There are solutions to these problems. It just takes us to come back to the question he asked me, which is not, is this the law? Is this just? And the second part of this speech that, he, that King gives, which I love so much this night, is he tells the story about the time that he and uh, Coretta went to Jerusalem for the first time. And they rode the drive from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is, of course, the location where the story of the Good Samaritan happens. And he says, I realized when I, when I took that road why it was the site of the parable, because it is a dangerous road. It is curvy and high mountains, and there feels like there could be robbers behind every turn. And so I realized the parable, of course, is that when the Levite and the priest walk by the man who is laying on the ground, he said, the problem is in that moment is the priest and the Levite ask themselves the wrong question. They ask themselves the question, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Because they could have been right. It could have been a setup. He could have been faking it. He could be ready to be robbed. He said the power of the Good Samaritan is that he reverses the question. He asks himself, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And that is the question that pushes us forward. When we started this mission to try to get 1,000 people off the streets and into housing, there were many people who had many hard questions, who said, well, what will happen to the property values in my neighborhood? Well, what if we spend too much money on this? What if folks don't deserve the ability to get housing because they haven't gotten clean yet? That is all versions of the wrong question, which is, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? We asked ourselves a different question for which the story is quite clear, which is, if we do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? I will tell you what will happen. In 2023, we set a record you never want to set, which is the most Denver residents who died outside on these streets in the history of this city. People talk about the numbers of 1,000 people inside. Let me talk about the number that matters to me. As of December 10th of this year, we had lost 311 people that had died outside on this city, almost one a day every single day. We knew winter was coming. We knew it was going to be cold and five degrees, and we knew we wanted to get folks inside and into housing. On December 10th, we started moving people in massive numbers out of encampments and into housing, housed more than 800 people from December 10th to December 31st. From December 10th, after 311 people had died outdoors, until the end of 2023, we did not lose a single person on the streets of Denver. That's what a city that asks itself the right question is capable of doing. I'll close with this story. You say, okay, Mike, that, that sounds great. I understand I should ask myself, you know, what will happen to this man if I don't help? I understand we should look for the stars, even in the moments of darkness. But how do you do that in a moment when I post a photo of my kids on social media and someone responds by saying, why don't you stop helping those damn illegal immigrants? How do you do it in a moment of such heated political division that it feels impossible to even have easy conversations, let alone hard conversations? And Dr. King opens this story about the Good Samaritan with just one incredibly powerful line, which is he says, let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. The idea that we are so willing to serve others, we're even willing to put ourselves at risk to do it. Amen. Uh, and I will tell you, you know, when I was um, a kid, um, I was a hot-tempered, emotional, stubborn kid. Many of you are not surprised to hear me say that, probably. Um, but I, um, I had a brother uh, who was very different. And what would happen was whenever I would start fighting, I would start taking swings at him, he would do the most amazing of things is he would actually open his arms and hold me closer. 
which seems like a crazy and dangerous thing to do because when you have the choice of either fighting or retreating, opening your arms wide open is one way to get hurt. It is also the only way to get healed. And what my brother realized is that it might make sense to respond with, with fists if you get attacked by someone that's a stranger. It makes no sense when that someone is your brother. All that meant for me to learn now is that in this city there are no strangers. There are only brothers and sisters. Which means why our inclination may be to fight or to run. If we want to walk into the world with a sense of dangerous unselfishness, we have to do it by insisting on doing with our arms wide open. And so when we decided we wanted to try to get 1,000 people housed in five months, which is faster and more than any city in America had ever done before, we knew we were going to have to have a lot of conversations. We held 60 town halls all across the city. And I will tell you, all the folks in those town halls were not excited to see me. In fact, when I walked in the door, sometimes they, the booze would just rain down as soon as I walked into the auditorium. But we came to one, and we got the advance call. There were 1,000 people there. And my security detail said, you know, we got some really angry people at the front door, so we're going to take you to the back door. I said, great, let's go in the front door. And we walked in the front and you stood there and shook everybody's hand as they walked in the door and some folks refused to shake my hand and some folks were angry and our family got death threats. But what we got to was the understanding that anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is only there because it is representing what is underneath, which is either sadness or fear. And so when I walked into one of these events and people were very upset about us potentially opening a shelter for homeless folks in their neighborhood, uh, I watched during the crowd for the first half hour, there's one woman who really, really wanted to raise her hand. And the group didn't get to her. And so I said, you know, I think we should hear out her question. And she stood up and she was angry. And she yelled at me and told me how much danger we were going to bring to her neighborhood and why she was afraid for her children. And she got a giant round of applause and everybody clapped. And instead of responding to her anger, I spoke to her fear, which is, I understand you raise kids in this neighborhood. I raise them too. We want to make sure those kids are safe every single day. And we also want to make sure the folks that are at risk of freezing to death outside your house are also safe every day. And as that event was over, I stayed and talked to people before they left. And she waited a long time to talk to me. And I went up, ready for whatever she might need to say again. And she said, um, thank you, I'm just afraid. But I really do want to help. Is there something I can do? And I threw my arms wide open. And she gave me a big hug. And she became a volunteer in the effort to try to successfully say, we believe we can walk into the world with a dangerous unselfishness. I will... Um, Say the last day with my dad, I got to be with him when he passed. And you go through that day not sure what to say at the end. Um, and so I started sharing with him. I just felt like he needed to know that he had done such a great job. And so I just started telling him about, you know, mom is, mom is okay. She's taken care of, she's happy, she does a wonderful life. My brother Johnny is great, his kids are okay. My three kids are wonderful thanks to the life you have given us. We are all taken care of. And he turned to me, and the single last thing he ever said to me was, that's what we're here for. That we're all taken care of. That's what we're here for. I keep that final note of his with me all the time on the long days. We are grateful for the fact that Dr. King left us a final note, too. And that note is, be joyful in the struggle because it is only when it's darkest when we can see the stars. That is, never stop asking ourselves, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And it is practicing a dangerous unselfishness because walking into the world with arms wide open is one way to get hurt but it is still the only way to get healed. And if we stand in those beliefs, if we hold those close, then actually his final words come alive. 
the last paragraph he ever spoke in public that night before he walked off the stage at the Mason Temple when he said, we've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. And I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not fearing any man because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Johnston. There's uh, difficult issues to tackle for this city and other cities, but it takes somebody with a character of integrity and a heart to lead. And Denver has been blessed with amazing mayors, and Mayor Johnston continues that legacy.